Let's visit France in the spring of 1940. No, not the cafes and bistros of the Champs-Élysées. Come with me to the frontier between France and Germany, where the two hostile states are faced off against each other. This is the beginning of World War II. Now, these two nations have been at war since the previous autumn, and Germany has already overrun Poland. But it's been a phony war here on the Franco-German border. Almost no fighting between France and Germany. A Sitzkrieg, as some folks cleverly called it. Should the Germans attack, the French are ready, or so they think. The French sit behind their impregnable Maginot Line. It's a series of strong points and forts built the entire length of the Franco-German border, and it's manned by 15% of the entire French army. Imagine yourself in one of these forts designed to stop a direct German attack across the border. Built of concrete, bristling with weapons, and the largest of them staffed with 1,000 soldiers each. Impregnable. The French had learned the lesson of the previous war. The technology dictated that defense had an almost insurmountable advantage, and so the French acted accordingly. But the line of forts stopped in the north at the Belgian border. The forts did not reach to the English Channel, and so a small portion of the Belgian border area was relatively unprotected, especially the area covered by a dense forest called the Ardennes. This forest was thought to be impassable to tanks and motorized transport. The French thought that the Ardennes was a barrier that would deter the Germans from attacking in that sector. This is what the French expected, and it probably made sense to conventional military thinkers. It had a kind of internal logic. But on the German side of the border, the thinking was different. New and revolutionary doctrines of war had been developed by a new generation of young and brash military officers such as Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian. These theorist soldiers recognized the new reality of the change in technology of war. They recognized the power of the armored tank and the deadly future of mechanized warfare, the power of mobility and massed firepower. Well, the Germans had no intention of fulfilling their role in the French battle plan. No, they had no intention of grinding up their army on the French Maginot Line. And so the Germans did not attack directly across the border into the teeth of the French defensive line. Instead, the Germans attacked through the Ardennes, exactly where the French did not expect an attack. And in doing so, the Germans obtained that rarity in modern warfare, strategic surprise. The Germans combined two strategic principles. Both have been used since ancient times. First is the assembly of activities in new and innovative ways. And the second is the principle of the indirect approach. You remember the tale of Hannibal at the Battle of Cannae in our first lecture, how Hannibal had taken the conventional arms and armies of the time and assembled their activities in new and effective ways for spectacular results? Well, the same thing occurred here in France in May of 1940. Military technology had advanced since 1918, the end of the First World War in Europe, but military establishments had generally failed to recognize how the new technologies would transform the battlefield of the next war. This was particularly true of mobile warfare involving the tank. Generals are usually accused of fighting the last war, and this occasion was no different. The Germans launched what became known as Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War. This involved using the available technology in new and different ways, and in this case, they used it in new and deadly ways. They combined the use of tanks, aircraft, and infantry in what we today called combined arms warfare. And in 1940, it was an innovation. Now, the second strategic principle the Germans used was the strategy of indirect approach. Rather than hurl themselves against the French defensive wall in a frontal assault, they swung around the French defenses. The Germans invaded Belgium and split the French army. They turned the French left flank and then cut the Maginot line off from the rest of France. It was over 
in six weeks. The Germans had defeated France and the British Expeditionary Force, which fled ignominiously at Dunkirk, one of the most complete victories and most humiliating defeats in military history. Now, in delivering the knockout blow to France, the Germans used an assortment of tactical principles of war to realize their strategic intent. Offensive, mass, maneuver, economy of force, and surprise. Let's talk about those principles of war, the principles of competition. Now, all smart and successful organizations make use of war principles, but we call them something else. So let's do call them principles of competition, because they can be utilized by anyone involved in any conflict, great or small. They can be used at the organizational level, and they can be used at the personal level. Now, many countries and many theorists have devised principles of war over the centuries. This noble and venerable lineage stretches back to the time of Sun Tzu, Vegetius, Caesar, Machiavelli, Clausewitz, Jomini, Foch, and many other notables. But regardless of the time and place and the personality, the principles have always retained a sameness. They may change at the periphery, but they maintain a steadfast core character. Now the hallmark of a sound principle is its successful application across time to situations in which the technology and the place and combatants may change, but the principle itself holds true. Principles serve as a north star to guide us, to keep us generally going in the right direction. For this lecture, let's appropriate for ourselves a set of principles of war distilled by British Colonel John Frederick Charles Fuller during World War I and into the mid-1920s and adopted almost immediately in a slightly different form by the United States military. These are principles that have been handed down less formally for centuries. Now, I think the best way to proceed is first to present a quick overview of the principles as found in the U.S. Army Field Manual, and second, to review the basics of each principle in more detail and to show how each principle can enhance our chances of success in situations of conflict and competition. The United States Army's principles of war are nine in number. They consist of the objective, direct every military operation toward a clearly defined, decisive, and obtainable objective. The offensive, seize, retain, and exploit the initiative. Mass, mass the effects of overwhelming combat power at the decisive place in time. Economy of force. Employ all combat power available in the most effective way possible. Allocate minimum essential combat power to secondary efforts. Maneuver. Place the enemy in a position of disadvantage through the flexible application of combat power. Unity of command. For every objective, seek unity of command and unity of effort. Security. Never permit the enemy to acquire unexpected advantage. Surprise. Strike the enemy at a time or place or in a manner for which he is unprepared. Finally, simplicity. Prepare clear, uncomplicated plans and concise orders to ensure thorough understanding. Now let's look more closely at each of these principles. The objective, the ultimate military purpose of war, is the destruction of the enemy's armed forces and their will to fight. Now, the ultimate objectives of our operations other than war are considerably less destructive and warlike. Nonetheless, we must have a clear objective or a mission. Our strategic intent must be clear to everyone who has anything to do with the planning and execution of our operations. Our strategic plan. At the personal level, we must be clear in our ultimate objective. It must inform and it must guide our use of all our principles. Because too often we can bog down in the minutia of the task. We can begin to confuse tactics with our goal. History is replete with master tacticians who were unable to
to connect to the larger strategic picture. Now, some critics have faulted the great Civil War general Robert E. Lee with being a master tactician, but a mediocre strategist, for failing to connect his many battlefield victories into a coherent campaign with logic, with scope, and with a vision for a decisive victory in war. Now, any operation must have a purpose, and it must be clear from the beginning. Each operation must contribute to the ultimate strategic aim. The attainment of all intermediate objectives must directly and quickly and economically contribute to the operation. The Army uses an analytical framework of mission, enemy, troops, terrain, and time available to guide it in rapid development of its operations. And commanders designate physical objectives, such as an enemy force, a dominating terrain feature, or other vital areas essential to the mission. Now, these become the basis for all subordinate plans, and no action is taken that doesn't contribute to achieving the main objective. And likewise, in our own strategic planning, the mission or objective must dominate and condition our thinking and our actions to adapt to the military framework. You can think of the enemy as a competitor or simply the forces that challenge you. Your troops, of course, are your employees, or else your own energy and resources. Your terrain, well, that's the business scape or the organizational landscape on which you maneuver. That is, your terrain includes the network hierarchy, the physical layout of your firm, the power structure with which you must deal. And if you plan for your firm, your terrain, it also includes the market space in which you maneuver against your competitors. The second most important principle is the offensive. This principle tells us that offensive action is the best way to attain our clearly defined objective. It is effective and it is decisive. Here we reject the adage that good things come to those who wait. Instead, we act. We act boldly, decisively, and with purpose. Offensive action is how we seize and hold the initiative while we maintain our freedom of action in war in sports, in business, and in politics. This is fundamentally true across all levels of our operations. We play defense only as a temporary necessity and only as a respite before we can seize the initiative and continue our own offensive operations. The reason for this should be clear. The side that retains the initiative through offensive action forces competitors to react rather than act. In the case of Blitzkrieg, the Germans seized the initiative in 1940 and retained it all the way to the defeat of France. Military doctrine holds that an offensive spirit must therefore be inherent in the conduct of all our defensive operations. And I submit that this is true in all situations where strategy is useful. So, okay, you're on the offense. Even when you're on defense, what do you actually do? Let's look at mass. Mass is the synchronization of combat power in concentrated time and space on your enemy. In everyday terms, well, the idea is to deliver a massive blow to your competitor. Generals like to say that it's akin to hitting the enemy with a closed fist, not a poke in the chest with a couple of fingers. Rain on your enemy with a perfect storm. Now, this is not as easy or as intuitive for some folks as it may seem. Synchronization of many moving parts of a large organization, this is difficult in the best of circumstances. Coordination is tough, but lots of things conspire against us to throw sand in the gears. Moreover, in more genteel surroundings, far from the grit and gunfire of military battle, we may seek less of a massive battle and more of an accommodation. Our motives and our goals may be complex. Nonetheless, when the decision is made to join battle, this principle suggests that we mass our resources for a decisive engagement. We must sustain our mass resources in our attack so that the effects have staying power. Mass, it seeks to smash the enemy, not sting him, says Army doctrine. Germany. World War II massed her panzer tanks for a decisive breakthrough in 1940 against the weakest part 
of the French line. But the mass you have is never unlimited. And so you need economy of force. Now, economy of force is wonderfully intuitively named. We economize the forces and resources at our disposal. Fuller, who named it, thought economy of force was the single principle that best summarized all of the principles of war. We deploy and we distribute our resources so that no part is left without a goal to accomplish. We want, well, we want none of our energy to languish, unused, neglected, forgotten. No part of the force should ever be left without a purpose. Now in all of this, we strive to attain a balance. It's very much like a cooking recipe to prepare the perfect dish. All of the ingredients must be allocated in the correct proportions. Likewise, in a conflict situation, when the time comes to act, well, all parts must move in accord with our plan. And all of those parts will have a role to play. In military operations, combat power is finite. It has to be judiciously employed. Given the stakes, nothing can be wasted. We allocate our combat power to its various tasks in measured degree. Limited attacks, defense, delays, deception, or even withdrawal operations. All of this must be carefully measured so that we can achieve mass elsewhere at the decisive point in time on the battlefield. Now in business, we must be likewise judicious and not squander our resources in peripheral adventures. Short-term gain, well, that can be alluring. And in our short horizon culture in the United States, the short-term gain usually wins out. But the strength of a hunter can be sapped pursuing rabbits when there's big game that requires more patience and all available resources. So how do we go after the big prizes? By the principle of maneuver. In competition, we want to position ourselves for maximum advantage. How this advantage is measured varies according to our enterprise. Do we maneuver against other job seekers? Do we maneuver against other mid-level executives? Do we maneuver against a tennis opponent across the net, against other candidates in a political race? Maneuver is the movement of our forces in relation to the enemy to gain position, positional advantage. When we maneuver effectively, it keeps the enemy off balance. We use maneuver to exploit successes, to preserve our own freedom of action, and to, result, to reduce our vulnerability. Now, when we focus on prudent and vigorous maneuver, it continually poses new problems for the enemy. It renders his actions ineffective, and it can eventually lead to his defeat. Maneuver is so much more than simply moving around, whether in sports or in business or in war. At all levels of operations, successful applications of maneuver, it requires agility of thought, plans, and organization. It's also necessary for us to apply the previous principles we learned, mass and economy of force. Our ability to maneuver is how we can determine where and when to join the fight by setting the terms of battle, by declining battle, or by acting to seize unexpected tactical advantage. By maneuvering with skill, we can make ourselves unpredictable, and thereby we can raise doubt and uncertainty and hesitation in the minds of our competitors. But how can a group of people maneuver with skill? Well, we need unity of command. And responsibility is a totem that many people pay homage to, but honor only when absolutely necessary. In fact, diffusion of responsibility and closed-door decision-making seem to be characteristic of modern corporate America. But in arenas where conflict um, is prevalent, responsibility cannot be abdicated. For decisive, directed and focused action, responsibility cannot be diffused. Unity of command and unity of effort is required if the objective is to be reached. In the military, unity of command means that all the forces are under one responsible commander. It requires a single commander with the requisite authority to direct all forces in pursuit of a unified purpose. Unity of effort, on the other hand, requires coordination 
cooperation among all forces, even though they may not be necessarily part of the same command structure, toward a commonly recognized objective. Now, of course, unity of command is not always attainable. It's an ideal that shortens response time. It leads to rapid decision-making and execution. And this is why unity of effort is the handmaiden to unity of command. Now, even in the military, unity of command may not be possible because of, oh, because of interagency or combined operations. Uh, this is why unity of effort becomes paramount. Unity of effort is coordination through cooperation and common interests. This is an essential complement to unity of command. So, what is a precondition for unity of effort? Security. We want to protect our own position from competitor encroachments, don't we? And so it's necessary to recognize that we cannot make our plans and execute them outside of consideration of our competitors' actions. We have to protect our own resources, our own market share, our own goal line, our own operations and our own personnel. We have to shroud our own intentions in a fog of deception and trails of false sense. The security of our own plans and capabilities enhances our own freedom of action by reducing our risk. Active security reduces our vulnerability to hostile acts, influence, or surprise. If we know and understand our competitors' strategy, their tactics, their doctrine, and staff planning, if we can anticipate their likely courses of action, then we can take adequate security measures. Well, so we're secure. What can unity of effort achieve? Surprise! Surprise! Surprise is such an important principle in warfare that some writers consider it the most single most important principle of strategy. German general Waldemar Erfurth penned a classic treatise on surprise between the two world wars. And he exalts surprise as a kind of, well, it's a kind of panacea to fighting while outnumbered. Surprise, if achieved at the strategic level, can bestow such incredible advantage on one side that it can settle the entire question. Our earlier example of the French defeat in 1940 is one such example of surprise deciding the outcome. Now, of course, many other things had to go right for the attacking Germans for surprise to have its decisive effect. For instance, the advantage bestowed by surprise must be exploited. But by itself, surprise in conflict stands as a force multiplier. Generals, of course, know that surprise can decisively shift the balance of combat power. By seeking surprise, forces can achieve success well beyond the effort expended. And we see examples of surprise and conflict almost every day. In sports such as football, trick plays and deception are designed to surprise the opposing team. We want to surprise our opponent, don't we? And we want to do so as often as possible to keep him off balance and so to interfere with his own plans. Many factors can contribute to surprise. We can achieve surprise with, with speed, with effective intelligence, with deception, with the application of unexpected force, with operation security, and with variations in our own tactics and our methods of operation. Surprise can be uh, in when we do something or how fast the size of resources deployed and the direction or the location of our main effort. Deception can aid the probability of achieving surprise. Now, if we pull everything we've been discussing together, we have this principle of simplicity. Complexity is the enemy of any good plan, and the simpler the plan, the better the chances of executing it successfully. This is especially true with large organizations or with projects that have lots of moving parts. The military has a saying that originated in Clausewitz, everything in war is very simple, but even the simplest thing is difficult. Now, to the, to the amateur strategist and to the armchair general, Military operations are really not all that difficult. Hindsight can make military geniuses of us all. We can replay battle after battle with great realism in today's simulations. But generals, well, generals have only one time to get it right, 
and they must get it right as history unfolds and as the bullets fly. On the cusp of a major conflict, with everything still in doubt and thousands of unknown variables poised to affect the outcome in ways we cannot begin to predict, it is the simple plan that is our salvation. In the corporate world, it's the simple and direct strategy with simple execution that best marshals the resources and the spirit of the firm. Simplicity contributes to successful operations. Simple plans and clear, concise orders to reduce misunderstanding and confusion. Here's an example. In the 1992 presidential election, Democrat political operative James Carville crafted a simple strategic message and theme for the ultimately successful Bill Clinton campaign. The message embodies several of the principles of competition as we have reviewed them here. The offensive, mass, and simplicity. And the message was, it's the economy, stupid. Now, this simple, hard-nosed message maintained focus and discipline in a sometimes faltering campaign. It masked effort on the weak point of the opposition party. It was a simple message for the Clinton campaign to execute. And it was a simple message for the rank-and-file voter to understand. Several very good reasons lobby for simple plans. Other factors being equal, the simplest plan is preferable. Simplicity is especially valuable when followers and leaders are tired. Simplicity in plans allows better understanding and leadership at all echelons and permits branches and sequels to be more easily understood and executed. So these are the principles of war as well as our principles of competition. Have a clear objective in mind. You must have a mission in mind. Seize the initiative. Seize the initiative and don't let go. Think of the Germans in World War II versus the French in 1940. Mass your efforts on a critical point. This harkens back to Jean Minnie's principle of concentration of mass and outnumbering your opponent on that critical point. Use all available power, but only in minimal power to secondary efforts. Limit your opponent's room to maneuver and expand your own room to maneuver. Unity of effort and where possible, unity of command. Secure yourself against your opponent gaining unexpected advantages. Surprise your opponent. Kiss. Keep it simple, strategist. And if you want an even simpler way to remember the nine principles, John Fuller, the British officer who first came up with such a list, suggested they can be remembered in just three groups. Control, pressure, and resistance. Now, these aren't the only strategic principles one might imagine. British defense doctrine, for example, has added maintenance of morale to the list we've been discussing. Indeed, a 1982 book by military scholar John Alger identified no fewer than 100 different principles of war offered by various thinkers throughout history. Moreover, some of us may have an aversion to talk of war and military conflict, and in fact, there are certainly theories that argue against competitive and warlike language of this sort. But we can always relocate these principles from the venue of armed conflict. If we consider them simply as methods or ways to deal with a pesky adversary or an aggressive competitor, the universal applicability of the principles becomes apparent. I believe that the ultimate test of whether these or any principles are valuable or not is in their utility. Do they help you? achieve your goals. As we'll see further in lectures to come, if the point is to learn how to think strategically, to exert a measure of control over a chaotic world and sometimes hostile world, then the principles of conflict are a valuable contribution to that effort.